In this video, we'll talk about um, ionic bonding. We'll start with just thinking about bonding in general. Bonding is when two atoms join together into a more stable arrangement. Uh, this means that the elements coming together will have to gain, lose, or share electrons to reach an electron configuration that's similar to a noble gas. This just means that it'll have a similar electronic environment as a noble gas, and noble gases have eight valence electrons around them. So elements are going to do what they can to gain, lose, or share electrons, so they feel like they have eight electrons around the nucleus in the valence shell, which is that outermost shell. In this course, we're going to focus on two types of bonding, ionic bonding and covalent bonding. Ionic bonding is going to occur when we have a cation and an anion, which are positively charged um, ions and negatively charged anions, uh, when they come together close to one another. And so we'll have something positive be attracted to something negative. Many textbooks like to talk about ionic bonding as the transfer of electrons from one element to another. Um, and this, I don't think, is an accurate description of what an ionic bond is. I think that the electron transfer definition is really a definition of a chemical reaction, um, and that's a redox reaction. And we'll spend time talking about these because they're fascinating, um, but we're going to hold off on that until we talk about chemical reactions. So for the purposes of this course, ionic bonds are just that electrostatic attraction between the anion and the cation. <laughs> we'll spend a lot of time working on covalent bonds too. Um, and for the purposes of introducing bonds in general, let's take a moment to look at that. Uh, covalent bonds are going to form when they actually, two elements or two atoms actually share electrons between two atoms. So each nuclei thinks that it has those electrons being attracted to it. So we'll focus on ionic bonding in this chapter, and then um, next week we'll start talking about covalent bonding. While we looked at the definitions of ionic versus covalent bonding, there's also kind of a, a handy rule of thumb that works most of the time. This is not a definition by any stretch of the imagination, and there are plenty of exceptions to this rule. But typically, ionic bonds are going to form between a metal and a nonmetal. So something from the left side of the periodic table, and this will be something that will form a cation because it will have a lower ionization energy, and then a nonmetal from the right side of the periodic table, which will typically be our anion, which has a higher ionization energy. Covalent bonds are then going to form when two things are actually shared, and so that we're going to see happen more with two nonmetals or between a metalloid and a nonmetal. So this will take place in kind of that upper right-hand corner of the periodic table. So sodium and chlorine form sodium chloride, which is table salt. Um, sodium in its elemental state is uh, a fun and explosive metal. Well, it's explosive if you put it in water. And chlorine on its own usually exists as uh, Cl2 and is a gas that's very toxic. Um, this is just usually Na. Sodium typically loses one electron, um, and chlorine typically gains an electron to form chlorine anion, and sodium will then form a sodium cation that'll have an overall positive charge, and chlorines will have an overall negative one charge. And so between these two charged species, an ionic bond can occur. Um, and that's because the positive sodium will be attracted to the negative chlorine. And this is going back to our, our kind of fundamental principle of chemistry that opposites attract. <laughs>
When we think about what ion will form for any given element, we use the octet rule to kind of guide how we determine the charge that we expect. The octet rule states that um, every element will gain or lose electrons, so that way it'll possess an octet in its outer shell or its valence shell. An octet really just means eight. Um, so everything's gonna try to have eight valence electrons for the most part. So we use this rule to predict what ions will form for an element, or we'll also use it to figure out how many bonds form in covalent bonding later on. So for things that are going to be typically metals um, on the left-hand side of the periodic table or in the middle, we can determine their charge just from their group number. If something has one valence electron, it'll form a plus one charge. A metal that has two valence electrons, is likely to form a plus two ion instead. This works for the first and second group and the third group. So groups one, two, and three A. The transition metals are a little bit different um, and they can form lots of different types of charges. We'll talk about them in a bit. Anions, so these are going to be typically our nonmetals um, in groups four and up, are going to form an anion charge that is typically eight minus the group number. Um, so if something has seven valence electrons, it'll gain one to form eight. So it means it'll have a negative one charge. And this is kind of counterintuitive, especially after coming out of math classes. When an element or an atom gains electrons, it's going to have a charge that is more and more negative. So the number gets smaller, becomes more negative, even though we're adding more and more electrons. So here's kind of a summary of uh, typical charges to know. So as you can see, all of my group seven elements that have seven valence electrons, each gain one electron to form a negative one anion. Everything in group six that has six valence electrons will gain two to form a negative two ion. And everything in group five will typically form a negative three anion as it gains three electrons to form an octet. Uh, group four could gain four or lose four. Typically it doesn't form, um, or carbon doesn't form ionic compounds. Um, and again, for our metals, we're looking at our as cations and our non-metals, we're looking at as anions. Our transition metals, we can consider having um, two valence electrons, but they also have electrons in um, their high energy d orbitals that are kind of closer to the nucleus. And so they typically form multiple different charges. And you do not need to memorize this for this class. Instead, you'll have to determine what charge a metal ion might be from the context of the chemical formula it's in. And so here we can see a lot of these will form plus two and plus three um, charges. Copper is kind of interesting because it does plus one and plus two. Um, and some of these will be plus three. And these are just the common charges. So you see this with our transition metals and our post transition metals on the periodic table. And again, as I said, these are just the most common ones. Iron can actually form an iron plus. Um, Iron plus three as well. Oh, sorry, iron, we already have that one. Iron plus four. Um, there's some evidence of iron plus fives as well. Um, those are much more rare. Plus two and plus three are its most common um, charges.